Hey folks, and welcome to our video on the four levels of meaning in film interpretation as discussed by David Bordwell and Kristen Thompson, mostly in their textbook, Film Art. But I also wanna mention that the four levels of meaning comes from an earlier book by David Bordwell called Making Meaning. The four levels of meaning discussed by Bordwell and Thompson are trying to provide a guide and a framework for understanding what it is we do when we say that artworks mean things, that they have meanings. And the discussion is, of course, revolving around film, but it could equally be applied to other kinds of artworks. And I do want to make clear that this is only one account of how meaning can be categorized in the history of aesthetics and the philosophy of art. There are four categories, referential, explicit, implicit, and symptomatic. The first one is referential. I'm going to start each category with a sentence that Bordwell and Thompson use to exemplify what a referential, implicit, explicit, or symptomatic meaning might look like when analyzing the film The Wizard of Oz. So this is an example of referential meaning in The Wizard of Oz. During the Depression, a tornado takes a girl from her family's Kansas farm to the mythical land of Oz. After a series of adventures, she returns home. Pretty bare bones, and that more or less looks like a plot synopsis of the film. Though referential meaning is not exactly synonymous with a plot synopsis, here's what Bordwell and Thompson say about it. Here, the meaning depends on the spectator's ability to identify specific items, the hard times of America in the 1930s, and features of Midwestern climate. A viewer unacquainted with such information would miss some of the meanings cued by the film. We can call such tangible meanings referential. In other words, what are the tangible things in a film that are referred to. It helps to understand when watching The Wizard of Oz that it is taking place at a specific time and place that are from the real world, 1930s America in the Midwestern climate. The film refers to those actual places and times. But you can also say that referential meaning includes things in a film that are not real, not part of our world. In the book Making Meaning, Bordwell writes, we can speak of both Oz and Kansas as aspects of referential meaning in The Wizard of Oz. Oz is an intratextual referent, Kansas an extratextual one. What he means here is that Kansas is a referent that exists in our world, that exists extratextually, that is beyond the text itself. But Oz doesn't exist in our world, and so it only exists within the text, intratextually. It's still a referent because it is constantly being referred to, and to understand the film, you have to understand that Oz is indeed a place. In addition to The Wizard of Oz, I'm going to provide my own examples of the four levels of meaning in the film Rear Window. So let's begin with an example of referential meaning in Rear Window. Confined to his New York apartment after a leg injury, photographer L.B. Jeffries spends his time watching his neighbors and begins to investigate a man across the courtyard who may have murdered his wife. Again, it's just more or less a plot synopsis, but it's important to note that a plot synopsis is made up of items that are referred to. So. New York as a space is an actual referent in the real world. Thorwald is not an actual referent in the real world, but is indeed a character who is referred to over and over again in the fiction. These little items, characters, places, settings, events, those are the stuff of referential meaning. Now let's get to explicit meaning. A girl dreams of leaving home to escape her troubles. Only after she leaves does she realize how much she loves her family and friends. Nothing she finds elsewhere can replace them. So now we're actually getting to the stuff that we might call meaning. We're getting away from the concrete actions and events and characters and objects of a film into things that we generally think of as meaningful. So here's what Bordable and Thompson say about that particular sentence as explicit meaning. If someone were to ask you the point of the film, what it seems to be trying to get across, you might answer with something like this. Perhaps you would also mention Dorothy's closing line, there's no place like home, as a summary of what she has learned. Let's call this sort of openly asserted meaning an explicit meaning. And I think the best way of understanding or summarizing the idea of explicit meaning is to say it's an openly asserted meaning. When Dorothy says there's no place like no home. No place like home. There's no place like it makes very clear to the viewer that the value of home, as distinguished from, say, the exoticism, the adventurousness of Oz, is an important tension in the film. It also matters that the line, there's no place like home, happens toward the end of the film, that it's dramatic, that it's in close-up, and that it is primed for the viewer to understand that the line of dialogue will be very meaningful. But that line of dialogue wouldn't be meaningful unless it made sense with respect to the tensions within the film. 
So think about the general tension between Kansas and Oz. Kansas is drab, but we come to learn safe and loving. Oz is attractive, full of color, full of adventure, but we come to learn dangerous and also full of artifice. We can also look at particular objects in the film as instantiating explicit meaning. Portable and Thompson write, Dorothy's strong desire to go home make the road represent that desire, the yellow brick road. At the same time, because it's made of yellow bricks, rare in our everyday world, it partakes of some of the magical qualities of Oz. So here, Bordwell and Thompson are just trying to substantiate the sentences that deliver meaning by drawing evidence from the film itself. The yellow brick road is a recurring object that matters to the film. But if we think about the importance of a yellow brick road in terms of its qualities, being made of yellow brick, and its function, a road being a thing that takes you from one place to another, it does in fact reflect the meaning embodied in the sentence, there's no place like home. What about Rear Window? So like Bordwell and Thompson who draw on lines of dialogue for explicit meaning, I'll try to do the same thing with Rear Window. We might say an explicit meaning looks like this. It may be unethical to watch somebody without being seen, even if doing so leads to a good outcome. Now, why do I suppose that this is an example of explicit meaning? Partly because discussions of voyeurism and the ethics of voyeurism are explicitly made in character dialogue. Jeffrey's nurse starts the film by talking about peeping toms. Oh dear, we've become a race of peeping toms, commenting upon Jeffrey's habit of watching people outside of the window. Notice there's a value judgment in her sentence. Much later in the film, Jeffreys and Lisa openly discuss the ethics of watching people outside of their window without themselves being looked at. Jeffrey says, I wonder if it's ethical to watch a man with binoculars and a long focus lens. Long focus lens. Do, do you suppose it's ethical even if you prove that he didn't commit a crime? I'm not much on rear window ethics. The fact that the characters themselves comment upon the ethics of the actions that they're doing in the film makes the ethics of voyeurism a good candidate for a topic of explicit meaning. Bordwell and Thompson note that not all films will have meanings so obviously commented upon by their characters. And indeed, you won't see this kind of thing in a lot of films. There's always room for family. We're family. Now I know you guys are family. But if you do see something like this, it's a good example of explicit meaning. Okay, what about implicit meaning? Here's Bordwell and Thompson's sentence. An adolescent who must soon face the adult world yearns for a return to the simplicity of childhood, but she eventually accepts the demands of growing up. Notice the difference here between a meaning that's about the value of home versus an adventurous space like Oz, which is explicitly discussed in the film, and something similar, but which is not in fact discussed, which is about childhood and adulthood. Here's what Bordwell and Thompson say about this. This one suggests that The Wizard of Oz is about something general, the passage from childhood to adulthood. On this view, the film implies that as they grow up, people may want to return to the apparently uncomplicated world of childhood. Dorothy's frustration with her aunt and uncle and her urge to flee to a place over the rainbow become examples of a general conception of adolescence. Unlike the no place like home line, this meaning isn't stated directly. We can call this suggestion an implicit meaning. When perceivers ascribe implicit meanings to an artwork, they're usually said to be interpreting it. So once again, what makes this implicit is the conceptual distance between what actually happens in the film and what the implied meaning is. What's actually happening in the film is Dorothy going from one place to another. But that journey from one place to another is taken to be a sort of allegory for something much more general, that is, going from one stage in your life, childhood, to adulthood. That conceptual distance between what's literally there in the film and what the film is said to be about is what makes it implicit rather than explicit. And also for Bordwell and Thompson, what makes that meaning an interpretation rather than just stating what's there in the film. What about Rear Window? So here with Rear Window, I'm going to draw on a famous implicit meaning that's been made over several decades about this film. Many scholars and critics have read the film Rear Window as about cinema going, or the medium of cinema. The film, as we mentioned, follows L.B. Jeffries as he is stuck in a wheelchair due to an injury and obsessively watches the people across a courtyard in the neighboring apartments. Many scholars have suggested that Jeffries conditions his immobility paired with his desire to look at something, and the fact that the people he looks at don't look back at him makes the film a pretty good allegory for the cinema experience. 
where we are sitting immobile in a theater, watching people on a screen who have never seen us before. So we might say, the medium of cinema, in which we watch people without being seen, much like Jeffries watches his neighbors, is pleasurable partly because it is voyeuristic. Voyeurism being the pleasure derived from looking at people who cannot themselves look back at you. And again, following Bordwell and Thompson's urge for us to find evidence for our interpretations, we might look at these moments from the film, where lines of dialogue suggest a connection between what's going on in the film and cinema itself. Lisa says, it's opening night of the last depressing week of L.B. Jeffries in a cast, using the language of theatrical exhibition, that is, art. She says, show's over for tonight, when she closes the windows, which points to both theater and cinema. And finally, she says preview of coming attractions, when she points to a nightgown that she's going to change into. They are explicitly using the language of cinema. So even though these lines of dialogue suggest a connection between the literal events of the film and cinema as a medium, it's important that in the film, nobody literally goes to the movies or has long extended discussions of movie going. That would make it explicit rather than implicit. Bordwell also adds something important to this discussion in the book Making Meaning. He says, the critic may take implicit meanings to be consistent with the referential and explicit meanings, or, as in the process of irony, implicit meanings may be posited as contradicting other sorts. So how might we view a tension between the explicit meaning that we gave to Rear Window and one of its implicit meanings? We said that one of the explicit meanings of Rear Window might look something like this. It may be unethical to watch somebody without being seen, even if doing so leads to a good outcome. This is reflecting the discussions that the characters have about the possibly bad ethical conditions of obsessively watching their neighbors and trying to piece together investigations about those neighbors. But we need to consider the important fact that the film does not punish the characters for what they're doing. In fact, it sort of rewards them. Because even though Jeffries and Lisa are merely piecing together hypotheses based on inferences with very little hard evidence, did anybody actually see the wife get on the train? I hate to remind you, but this all started because you said she was murdered. Now, did anyone, including you, actually see her murdered? The film's what? plot makes it the case that they are in fact correct about Thorwald being a murderer. If the film were truly trying to deliver a moral lesson about the negative ethical conditions of voyeurism, it might punish our voyeuristic characters, but it doesn't. So we might say an implicit meaning of the film, in light of this fact, could look like this. The ethical dimensions of voyeurism are easily usurped by its pleasures. So it might be difficult to say what the moral of the film, what the ethical stance of the film is on voyeurism, but that it wants to illustrate how seductive voyeurism is. And by extension, how seductive cinema as a voyeuristic medium might be. Therefore, we might say an extended implicit meaning could look something like this. Cinema is pleasurable because it projects our fantasies onto a screen. We might say that the film, in exposing all the fallacies of Jeffrey's logic through the character of Doyle, the detective who always reminds us that we need hard evidence in order to make these wild accusations, we might say that Rear Window is not trying to make a moral, but is trying to illustrate something about cinema's seductive qualities, that it gives us what we want, even if what we want is incredibly implausible. Bordwell and Thompson will also make this really important point that explicit and implicit meaning suggest very broad concepts often called themes. So we might say that the little sentences that we came up with for explicit and implicit meanings could approximate what we might call themes, which are broad and importantly abstract ideas conveyed in artworks. Now themes are not the same thing as morals. They don't have to be, say, rules to live by. But what themes do have to be is they have to be abstract rather than concrete. Notice that when making these interpretations, we've consistently looked to abstract concepts like adolescence like voyeurism. For instance, I wouldn't say that a theme of Rear Window is murder. Murder is a concrete thing that happens in the plot. In addition, I would never say that a theme of the Fast and Furious franchise is cars. But I might say that a theme is the importance of family relations. Okay, the last one is symptomatic. Here's their example of symptomatic meaning. In a society in which human worth is measured by money, the home and the family may seem to be the last refuge of human values. This belief is especially strong in times of economic crisis, such as that in the United States in the 1930s. So why is this interpretation symptomatic? And what do we mean by symptomatic? This interpretation treats an explicit meaning in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home, as displaying a set of values characteristic of a whole society. So it's possible to understand a film's explicit or implicit meanings as bearing traces 
of a particular set of social values. We can call this symptomatic meaning, and the set of values that get revealed can be considered a social ideology. So let's just consider that word symptomatic for a second. A symptom, like a cough when you have a cold, is something that we can see that reveals a condition that we can't see, that is, the germs in your body that give you the cold. In a similar way, a symptomatic reading of an artwork is an assertion that this artwork has certain meanings that reveal social values that existed around that art object in the time and place in which it was made, right? Bordwell and Thompson say it displays a set of values characteristic of a whole society. So rather than say that there's no place like home is a universal value, the symptomatic reading wants to assert that it's actually tied to a couple specific conditions, that the film was made in a society in which human worth is measured by money, say a capitalistic society, and that the belief is especially strong in times of economic crisis, say the Great Depression in the United States in the 1930s. Most symptomatic readings are about social and political values and also identities, things like race, class, and gender, things like economics. Let's check out an example of symptomatic meaning in Rear Window. We might say, the film's organization of romantic desire around Jeffrey's perspective, in which we are made to care about Jeffrey's interest in Lisa, not Lisa's interest in Jeff, reflects the traditional patriarchal gender roles that guide the narrative conventions of classical Hollywood cinema more generally. Notice that I'm talking about societal values, patriarchal gender roles, and I'm also tying them to specific conditions, the narrative conventions of classical Hollywood cinema more generally, or the cinema from the 1930s to the 1950s. To go beyond that, we might draw on one of the most famous symptomatic readings of Rear Window in film studies, the reading which comes from Laura Mulvey's essay, Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. In Mulvey's reading of Rear Window, she pairs the allegorical reading of the film as emblematic of cinema itself with an examination of the gender roles and the gender dynamics between Jeff and Lisa. And she comes up with a really interesting theory about one particular aspect of the film's plot. She says, Jeff's girlfriend Lisa had been of little sexual interest to him, more or less a drag, so long as she remained on the spectator's side. That is, so long as she was confined to the realm of the apartment. But when she crosses the barrier between his room and the block opposite, that is, in a moment in the film in which Lisa goes into Thorwald's apartment as part of their investigation, she writes that a relationship is reborn erotically. In a sense, what Mulvey is arguing is that when Lisa becomes an object on film, if we take the objects in the window to be emblematic of what's on a movie screen, she becomes interesting to Jeffries. That is romantically interesting to Jeffries. This suggests that the nature of Jeffries desire for his girlfriend reveals something about the nature of desire perpetuated by cinematic conventions that women on screens are beautiful objects for male consumption. What makes this interpretation symptomatic is the assertion that what happens in the film reflects broader social values. But it's important to know that there's another dimension of symptomatic meaning that Bordwell makes really clear in making meaning. He says, in constructing meanings of types one to three, the viewer assumes that the film knows more or less what it is doing. But the perceiver may also construct repressed or symptomatic meanings that the work divulges involuntarily Moreover, such meanings are assumed to be at odds with referential, explicit, or implicit ones. This is a really useful point that Bordwell makes. Most times we use the phrase symptomatic meaning in the humanities when we're talking about the interpretation of artworks. We mean that such a meaning is not conveyed intentionally by the filmmakers. We are instead suggesting that because all artworks are made within social worlds and all filmmakers and artists are influenced by the society in which they grow up, they themselves have values that they may not be consciously aware of when they're making their artworks. A symptomatic reading of a film or an artwork is a way of making explicit, of making apparent to the reader what those values might be, even if the filmmaker was unaware of them or not trying to convey them in their film. So Laura Mulvey's interpretation of Rear Window is an interesting case because she actually suggests that Hitchcock is likely reflecting upon the gender dimensions that she's talking about. But very often when you make a symptomatic reading, you're suggesting that the film is not aware of what's going on, that the filmmakers are not aware of what's going on, and that you need to show your reader that there is a guiding logic to the film that is hard to see and that reflects broader social values. This is why most readings of artworks that might be Marxist or Freudian are going to be symptomatic meanings. 
because they suggest that a film reveals the larger structures of society, be they economic in a Marxist reading, or be they psychosexual in a Freudian reading, even if the filmmaker did not intend to put those meanings into their film. Okay, and that's all I have for the four levels of meaning in film interpretation, and I'll see you next time.